we live? Can you guys hear me? See me? Is everything working on that end? Am I live? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, everyone. Hello. Um, tonight, we're probably just going to be going over everything from period four. So 1450 to 1750 is the whole period. It's probably going to be around an hour, though I can foresee it being a lot longer because if you guys ask a lot of questions, which I'm happy to answer, and then I'm going to be going through all the content. And so it could take more than an hour. Um, so yeah, tonight we're just going to be going over all the content, answering any questions you guys have, just kind of going through all of that stuff. So let's, um, so, uh, first I just want to see like on a scale of one to five ish, how do you guys feel in period four, just on all the content in general, one to five, one, four. Okay. So we're kind of all over the place. Six. Three. Okay. So we're kind of in the middle. See a lot of ones, a lot of zeros. <laughs> That's okay. That's what we're here for. A lot of threes. Okay, that's good. That's a good starting point. So I can, you know, no a nine. Perfect. Okay, so let's just jump right into this. I know someone said earlier that they wanted me to say right uh, right now what the um, the key concepts were. First, let me just tell you um, under the live stream, if you see a little button that says like slides and resources, you can look at the slides as I go through them and stuff. So if you want to do that, you can see the the notes that I have for everyone and all that stuff. So let's just um, let's jump right into it. So um, I'm going to keep the, the slides open like this just so I can see the chat every so often. But all right. So first, let's just start by talking about why, like the periodization of period four. So, you know, we have these dates, 1450 to 1750. But the real important thing isn't just to memorize those dates, but to actually understand why those dates are important. Why, why are those dates the ends and beginnings of time periods? So first, let's just talk about what's in 1450 that causes it, that's a turning point that causes a new time period to start. So we see in 1450, we have the classical trade routes are intensified, the fall of the Byzantines, it's good. Um, Islam, Islam spans the entire Afro-Eurasia. The Mongol empire has been broken up. We know in the 12, 1300s ish, uh, that empire rises and then falls in like a hundred years ish maybe. Um, and we see the Americas are still isolated. Um, and so we still see kind of no interaction or very little interaction between um, the Europeans and Africans and uh, Asians and uh, the Americas. And then we see interaction start to intensify a lot in 1450. So we see trade intensify and stuff like that, similar to what we've been seeing in uh, period three. So, if, you know, continuity there. Uh, and then what we'll be talking about basically is the during and by 1750. That's really the meat of what tonight's going to be. So. Um, so before we get um, before we get into like the all the changes that happens during the time period, let's just first talk about what actually continued. So first off, um, the classical and post-classical trade routes they generally changed and intensified during this time period. So uh, is it loading for people, or am I live? I just want to make sure people can actually hear me. People can hear me, or it's loading. I just want to make sure. Okay, yeah. If it's if it's laggy, uh, that might be just an issue due to connections and stuff. But anyway, um, so let's just talk about first the fact that uh, content the trade routes during post classical era they they changed they didn't really they stayed. That's the I'm like losing my words here. They stayed and then they intensified during this time period. So we keep the Eurasian trade routes, the Indian Ocean trade routes. The Silk Roads and the Eurasian trade routes, all these things that you've been learning about all year, they stay um, throughout this time period. People tend to just kind of see this time period as um, the Americas and the Colombian Exchange, Triangular Trade. But you got to remember that these trade routes also stayed in practice. They were still traded on pretty constantly because, I mean, there was still trade among China, Europe, Africa, and all around there, Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, uh, and stuff like that. So that definitely continued during this time period. All right, so the first um, key concept of uh, this time period is that of globalization and the globalizing uh, networks of exchange and communication. So basically, here, let me just, because people seem to be having stuff. Let me see if my mic's working. I'm pretty sure it is, but can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure. I feel like a lot of people are saying that their sound went. Okay. Okay, this, this is weird. This has never happened before. Anyway, I'm just going to ignore it. So. The first key concept is globalizing networks of communication and exchange. So this is kind of the big 
overarching, one of the big overarching themes of this time period. Uh, and so here, so the first thing we see are explorers in this time period. We see uh, Spanish explorers and Portuguese explorers especially, which I'll be talking to you more in detail about, but just some of the big ones are Henry the Navigator who goes uh, to West Africa. We see Columbus who everyone sees, uh, knows, he goes obviously to the Americas. We see the Columbian Exchange, we'll be talking about that later. Uh, we see, and then we also see Vasco da Gama who goes to India. He's the first European, I'm pretty sure, to hit India from a trader. He goes around Africa. Uh, we also see new technology come from this globalization. So we see from period three, we see the improvements of some uh, technologies. We, we see an improved astrolabe, which came from the Muslim world. Uh, we have better maps, better cartography, which helps sailors find their way around uh, wind patterns. So if you remember from period three, the monsoons with, the, uh, with India and the Swahili coast, we have uh, monsoons. And then we also have um, westerlies being used to take people from Europe to the Americas and back in a cycle. So the winds are really important and knowledge of them really helps people go during this time period. And then we see caravels, which um, I'll be talking about more in detail. They're basically like you have the Arab Dows, you have the, um, sorry, I'll try to slow down. Um, you have the uh, Arab Dows and you see the Chinese junks. The Europeans also have this same um, type of kind of individual boat. It's called the caravel. They're smaller ships that generally were used to take people back and forth from the Americas and participate in this exchange. And so the big thing in this time period, basically, that is this whole giant connection between the Americas and Eur uh, Eurasia is the Columbian Exchange, which I'm assuming that a majority of you, if not all of you, have learned about. Um, during this time period, we see, and I'll show you a little graphic for this, uh, you see the Atlantic world from the, uh, from the New World, you see corn, potatoes, cocoa, and stuff like that go to from the old world or the new world to the old war world. And then from the old world, you see sugar, slaves, and disease are three of the big ones. And then just a general exchange of foods, of culture, of disease, as I mentioned. I'll be talking about that more. I'm generally giving just a general overview for now. Um, and then you also see joint stock companies rise. And so what joint stock companies are, and I was definitely really confused uh, with this at first, is that basically imagine if you, a government, had to just pay for a voyage or you had to pay for a voyage and then it sank. You lose all of your money in that voyage. Whereas now it's like the original version of crowdfunding where you'll get a hundred, a thousand, however many people to put in a bunch of money and they kind of, it splits up the cost of a voyage across, you know, hundred people so that if the, let's say the ship sank, you might only be losing a thousand dollars rather than a million dollars. And so it kind of secures the people who, um, who are going to be paying for this. And then obviously from this globalization, there's a bunch of different impacts. Uh, so you see the spread of religion. We see just the three big ones, the three big uh, proselytizing religions, Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism. Those will spread to the Americas and form a bunch of syncretic religions, which if you don't know syncretism is basically, it's a big term in AP world. You should know it. It's basically the melding, the merging of two um, two different religions, two different cultures into one. So we see uh, voodoo in the Caribbean, the cult of saints in Louisiana, and then Sikhism in India, which we'll all be going into more detail. So with voodoo, it's, uh, I believe, Christianity and Islam. I could be wrong, but, um, but it, it's, uh, it's one of the, one of two religions. And basically it's, uh, about like spirits and if you think of like a voodoo doll type of thing you know stuff like that that comes from the voodoo religion that was syncretic and then Sikhism you see in the Mughal Empire those are like the two big ones that you should know uh, it's a merging of Hinduism and Islam uh, that comes together and then you also see innovations in arts so generally in history when people start getting rich um, you generally start with the arts start to flourish so we see things like the Renaissance which I'm sure you all know about uh, woodblock printing, kabuki theater, stuff like that really takes off during this time period because simply people are richer now. People are, you know, countries are making a bunch of money from the new trade routes, the new Colombian exchange that's happening. And so the Renaissance starts, and we'll be talking about that later, and woodblock printing and kabuki theater.
And so those are all big things. And so now we'll start getting into like the more specific parts that I just talked about. So this is the Columbian Exchange right here. Basically what it is, is the connection of Europe and Asia and Africa to the Americas. And you can see both places brought a bunch of stuff to each area. So we see the big things to know from Europe, maybe I think sugar is big, animals, you should know that it really did revolutionize life in uh, Asia. I mean, not Asia, wow, the Americas, because you have cattle, you have sheep, the pig, the horse, things you think of as inherently that have kind of always been here. They really showed up in the Americas during this time period. The horse, you know, Native Americans didn't have horses before this time period. And then you see just a couple centuries later, they're dependent on the horse in the Great Plains and, the, uh, and that area. And then you also see disease spread. So this is kind of definitely emphasized in AP World, but I didn't know this at first. You see diseases like smallpox, that's the big one that goes to the Americas. And this decimates the Native American population. And this is because um, this is because in Europe, they've been living with smallpox in their lives for the past, you know, thousands of years. Whereas in North America, they had never seen this. They had been isolated, remember, for the past, you know, 8,000, 9,000 years, 10,000 years. And so they had never seen this before. And so when smallpox comes over from the new world, they had never built up the immunities that the Europeans had before. And so they just die by the thousands, by the millions. You see, it's called the great dying. You see around 90% of the Native American population die in a span of maybe 100 years, give or take. It's definitely a really, people even now call it a genocide. That's how bad it was. It, it almost wiped out the entire population. And then from the Americas to Europe, you see things like tobacco is a big one that really fuels uh, the economy during this time period. So you see um, plantations of tobacco show up in the southern, what now is the southern United States. And you see sugar plantations in the Caribbean that show up and really start facil facilitating this exchange that happens um, during the fourth time period. So you see, because of globalization, there's this giant just world shifting uh, exchange between the Americas and Europe. So these are some of the um, some of the travelers you should probably know. So right all the way on the left, you see um, that that's Henry the Navigator. What he's really known for is um, he's really known for uh, supporting sailing and cartography and stuff by setting up schools of navigation in Portugal. He was a Portuguese prince, and um, and he really patronized the voyages of many, many travelers uh, and really helped get this whole ex uh, age of exploration get started. Uh, next to him, I think we all know that's Christopher Columbus. Um, Christopher Columbus, we all know he went from, you know, we all know the famous story where he thought he landed in India and called them Indians, and, but he had actually landed in the Americas. It's a lot more complicated than that, obviously. Uh, Christopher Columbus was his name. You might be, I don't know if you're joking or not, but it's, his name was Christopher Columbus. And um, and so basically that's what he's known for. And he's one of the more important travelers that if there's like one that you're going to know out of all of them, uh, you're going to want to know Columbus out of all of them. He definitely was a very influential person. Uh, the one next to them is Vasco da Gama. He was, as I mentioned, the very first, na uh, not Native American, <laughs> the very first European to go from Spain and from Europe all the way to uh, India. And so you see now Europe starts getting involved in the Indian trade routes and you see them start setting up um, their joint stock companies and they're real getting into their, um, their territory there. And you also see um, the reason that they went around from Spain and from Portugal rather than you might be thinking, you know, why didn't they just, I'll show this map again. Why didn't they just go from Spain and walk through the Mediterranean or go through the Eurasian trade route? and just go to uh, India from there. The big reason because of that is because, remember, in this time period, the Ottoman Empire in 1453 takes over the Byzantine Empire, and they start really crippling Europeans uh, trade-wise. They are essentially the driving force that pushes them to the, uh, to the West, that really forces them to find new trade routes rather than go just through the Middle East. So that's why, if you were thinking, you know, why didn't Vasco da Gama, Christopher Columbus, just go west, go east to India? That's why, because the Ottoman Empire was in their way. Um, 
So this is this is just a map of the major trade route. Uh, sorry, not trade routes. Some of the major, um, some of the major like routes that these explorers took. You don't need to know these by heart. You definitely don't need to know every single one of those explorers listed. One of the big ones that I forgot to mention because I was talking about Eurasian ones um, was Zheng He. He is really important. He came from China in the early 1400s. It was 1405 when he first made his first voyage. And he basically took these giant boats um, all around Afro-Eurasia, all the way to, you can see his little orange line there, all the way to the Swahili coast. And so as it says there, official Chinese maritime activity expanded into the Indian Ocean region with naval voyages led by Zheng He, which uh, enhanced Chinese prestige. Remember, at the end of period three, China's on top of the world. I mean, the Song Dynasty, they're going crazy. They've got gunpowder. They've got, you know, all their inventions. They've got paper, fireworks. Um, and so just Zheng He's journeys really start to enhance China more. The only, uh, the only reason that China didn't stay super powerful during this time period was because um, in 1433, he was forced to stop his voyages. So almost 66 years, no, 60, 60 something or 59 years before um, Christopher Columbus went on his first voyage to the Americas, Zheng He had been long dead already. And so you see kind of that, you know, China was on top of the world and then you try to this is the time period when you start seeing China's kind of decline into what they'll eventually become in the 19th and 20th centuries, which is not great. Uh, a big part of this globalization movement is the, um, is the triangular trade. And so I was just talking uh, to someone about this the other day. The triangular trade is really the major trade route in the uh, Atlantic. So, you know, we have the Silk Roads, we have the Indian Ocean trade route, we have the Mediterranean trade route. And then it's not just the Atlantic trade route, it's the um, it's the triangular trade. And as you can see, it's called that clearly because, you know, it forms a triangle with Europe, Africa, and the Americas. And so you see from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Americas, from the Americas, you see things like rum, sugar, really going to Europe, and from, uh, and sugar and rum, going to the uh to the europeans from their colonies so that's the real reason that they um they had these colonies they didn't um they didn't have those resources there it wasn't as available in europe and so they took colonies in order to ship that stuff in and you see during this time period a new economic system uh rise and this is a really important thing in time period four it's called mercantilism it's essentially the idea that a country will export more than it imports so it can make a profit on its um its goods and its services rather than having to buy a bunch of stuff and do that they're going to sell a bunch of stuff essentially so uh, another large part of this is the middle passage so essentially that's just the uh, route that slaves took uh, and it took millions of slaves across the atlantic i'm pretty sure the united states didn't outlaw the slave trade across from africa until 18 Await, I want to say so. Really, all through this time period, slavery slavery had existed before. I want to, and uh, I really want to like make that known. This these weren't the first slaves. There had been a Muslim slave trade going on for at least hundreds of years, if not thousands. The only difference was, and you could potentially get a comparison essay on this on the exam. The Muslim slave trade uh, mostly focused on women and their roles as a slave is much different in the Americas than it was in um in the arab world so in the muslim world you see things like slaves doing household tasks and more you know cooking cleaning more domestic things and that's why they really had more um that's why they had more women uh morgan if you're confused you can feel free to ask a question or i'm gonna kind of after every time uh, every key concept i'm gonna go through the questions and answer those um, so if you guys are confused, feel free seriously ask a question or drop something in the chat about what you're confused on. And I can, I, I'll be happy to go over that. I'm here for you guys. Uh, in what period was this Muslim slave trade? It was, it was continuing during this time period. It was periods three and four mainly are the big ones. Period five, I'm not really sure about. It's not really a, it wasn't, uh, as in, uh, enhanced as the, um, Atlantic slave trade during this time period, you really see the Atlantic slave trade just blow up. I mean, by the end of the 15, 1600s, 
things are going crazy with the um, with the slave trade. And the reason they needed this is because not only had all of the Native Americans died from smallpox, they needed labor to work on their uh, their sugar plantations. So that's why in the Americas, slaves were first of all commonly male, and they were commonly used for um, for plantation work. So you don't see them as much. There are some, but not as much in the Americas and in, I mean, not in the Americas, in household tasks like you see in the Muslim empires. And that's definitely a comparison that you could be able to draw because of it. All right. And then finally, from globalization, you see the, uh, uh, the visual and performing arts start to really take over, not just in Europe with the Renaissance, but you see this in Asia because of the silver trade. You see this in um yeah mainly asia and uh the europe and yeah it did affect gender proportionality in west africa that's definitely something you should note that because of slavery they were taking all the men uh, not all of them but a lot of the men and um and not all of the women so they're it really hurt their gender imbalance finally so we see this visual and performing arts and we're, i'm going to go over a bunch of examples of art and architecture that are really important to this time period at the end of this so I'll be sure to kind of explain specific pieces. But so we see, because of this new trade, we see countries get stupidly rich, like beyond rich. They start, um, what diseases do we need to know besides smallpox? Malaria, maybe. Smallpox is the big one. That's the one that really kills a bunch of people. But here, I can go back. There, like you can see smallpox, malaria, the flu, influenza, the whooping cough, measles. Those are kind of the bigger ones that really kill people. But you, do, by no, there, by no means do you need to have a list in your mind. Smallpox is like if you're going to know one, smallpox is the one to know. All right. So back to the performing arts and the visual arts. So we see the Renaissance, obviously in um, in Europe. We see that in the South and the North. So if you're in AP Euro at all, you're going to have to learn about like the specific pieces and stuff. But for this course, you really just have to know that the Renaissance happened. You might want to know a couple of very, you know, little few humanists and stuff like that. And you might probably know people like Da Vinci and Michelangelo and other Renaissance people like that. But you won't be asked very specific things about the Renaissance. The Renaissance is probably more of an evidence point than anything. You also see Ottoman miniatures arise, and those are mainly used uh as a way of getting power for people what period did the renaissance occur uh it wasn't a set date thing it was more like i'd say yeah 1450-ish to like the end of the the mid 1600s i'd say but yeah period four is kind of all you need to know so yeah jillian thanks for helping out <laughs> um so then you also see literacy rise so you see things like cervantes writing don quixote um an ottoman miniature yeah wow i completely Cut myself off. I lost my train of thought. Thank you. An Ottoman miniature is basically a little painting that they made to, um, it was mainly used to establish power for people. And it was their just kind of art form from the Ottoman Empire. So if you see, like, for example, let's say you see a DBQ um, and you see a, an Ottoman miniature, you're going to want to know what an Ottoman miniature actually means. And then finally, you see woodblock printing in Japan, which is just another art form. Uh, you don't really need to know the very specific, specific, specific you know, things about each art form, just kind of know where they came from, be able to kind of know a few little things about them. You also see performing arts rise. So Shakespeare, obviously, uh, Natasha, DBQs are, are easy with a lot of practice. It's definitely a very practice based thing, but it's they get easy as throughout the year. Uh, so you see Shakespeare with obviously his famous play uh, plays, you see um, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, um, some other ones that I can't think of right now, but just he, he's one of the most prolific playwrights of the, uh, Brit of, of the Northern Renaissance. And then you see Kabuki theater in Japan. So that also rises as a new performing art because of new riches and new cultural, um, things being built. Uh, you also see the scientific revolution. So this happens around the same time, maybe a little later than the Renaissance. There's definitely some overlap where you see new scientific theories start being built and you see, People move from science based off faith, based off God told me or God said this, to experiment. You see people start doing things based off, I have empirical numbers and data that prove this. And so you see Copernicus proving his heliocentric theory that the sun is in uh, in the center of the solar system as opposed to what the church thought. Uh, you see blood circulation and laws of motion by Newton. Does the scientific revolution lead to the industrial revolution? 
I'm sure there could be an argument there, but maybe not directly, but there's definitely thought there. So I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to say no. By the way, um, just from now on, if you have a question, just drop it in the ask a question section, since that's where I'm really going to be asking, uh, answering questions more in depth and stuff. Since I'm trying to get through the content on the slides and then answer questions. So speaking of, I'm going to answer the 13 questions that there are now, and then we'll move on to key concept uh, 4.2. All right. Would there be a way to discuss continuities and changes over time comparing different regions? Uh, yeah, that's definitely a big, uh, big topic in this time period. You see uh, changes in some in everywhere, almost pretty much, and continuities pretty much everywhere. And you, you very well might get something that says compare the impact of the Colombian Exchange on the Americas and on Africa. That's definitely something that you could really see. Um, and so you should know how things affect things differently and how places change and con uh, continue over time. <clears throat> All right. How do you study for the periodical uh, in class tests? What technique works best for you? For me, for studying uh, in class, it was mainly just a matter of essentially going through my notes, doing practice questions, and then making sure I understand the material, not just on a, you know, just like a surface level knowing, oh, Shakespeare wrote this or, you know, Copernicus did this. You want to also know things based off of the fact that you want to be able to make connections between things. And that's the real big thing with this course. You're not going to be able to do well on the exam if you just know dates, if you just know, um, if you just know people, dates, and specific things. Those are definitely really important to know, but more important are making connections between things and knowing how things compare, continuities, changes, stuff like that. Um, and for me, really going through my notes and just making sure I understand things the best. And yeah, like what Kenneth is saying, annotate your notes, draw a concept web. And then when you're studying, do what works best for you. So asking me isn't exactly, you know, if you work best from videos, watch from talking to your teacher, talk to your teacher, so on and so forth. And so really, and it is a skill that you have to build up. So don't think, oh, I can't make connections between these things. I'm hopeless. It's definitely far from that. It's it takes a lot of practice and a lot of thinking. Some people it comes easier to others than others, but really that's the main point of this course, All right? Um, would you say that the Columbian Exchange and Columbus's voyage were the most important of all period four events? Um, I mean that's a very argumentative question, very opinionated. So take what I say with a grain of salt. I would say yes. But that doesn't mean that, and you're never going to be asked what was the most important thing in period four. You're going to be asked something like, to what extent was blank a turning point in world history? And so I would say the Columbian Exchange was really a giant turning point. And that's why I would say it's the most important. But it, it could be argued. All right. Uh, the expansion of European maritime empires. Yep. So that's definitely something that happens during this time period. You see uh, countries like the British, the Dutch, the Spanish. Uh, and the Portuguese, those are the big four. Uh, and they, so we see the Spanish and the Portuguese take over the Americas, and then the British and the Dutch, they go to India and they establish their joint stock companies, which is what I was telling you about earlier. So they established the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company independently. Sorry, I'll, I'll try to slow down. I know I'm, I kind of tend to ramble. All right, so I'll start over. So basically, uh, European maritime empires, they, uh, such as Spain and Portugal, those were the two ones that really took over the Americas mainly. So they went on their ships, they went over, and people like Hernan Cortez and uh, Pizarro, they were the ones who conquered the Americas, the Andes, the Incas, the Aztecs, and they um, and they were the ones who established their empires using specifically, and if you've ever read Jared Diamond, using guns, germs, and steel, really. Um, in order to get these empires to fall. So um, basically they had guns, they had smallpox. They were really, it was an unmatch. It was not a fair match. Uh, and then you see places like the British and the Dutch, they take the opposite route and they go to India. And they essentially, what they do is they establish their joint stock companies there so they can start disrupting the European trade and the, I mean, the um, Spain and Portugal. They start having the um, the Indian Ocean trade with Europe, so they start really starting to get in there. <clears throat> uh, 
what was the driving factor of the Colombian exchange? The driving factor was really um, European voyages. And then you see, I was, I was talking about the Ottoman Empire. I'll go back to that map. Um, there it is. The Ottoman Empire, really, around Turkey. <coughs> <coughs> they start to push the Europeans westward and start to really um, block off trade. And so they were forced to go west. Uh, I'll drop the... Um, I'll drop the slides in the link to the, I have a folder basically of a bunch of notes, a study guide and stuff like that. Um, if you click on the green button under there, uh, you can see the slides. And if you can't access it, if you get like uh, click to ask for access, it just means that if you're logged into a school account, it just means that they don't take outside uh, sharing. Uh, the driving force was mainly the Ottoman empire uh, pushing them out. All right, so let's start getting into key concept 4.2, which is, in my opinion, my favorite uh, key concept. And so this is the new forms of social organization and modes of production. So this is really, you know, we've globalized, new empires are established. Now what? What happens when the Europeans go over to the Americas and encounter these Native Americans and encounter, you know, and slavery starts and stuff like that? So first, I'll just give you a major uh, overview, and then we'll start getting into things really more in depth. So we see because of a new global demand for goods, we'll, we're gonna see new uh, labor uh, systems and trends because new goods being needed, new more people are needed to make them. And so first we see serfdom and peasant labor in Siberia, so all the way in the East. Uh, uh, Russia starts expanding because of, uh, and they develop their sardom, Basically, you see that expansion and peasants really go to Siberia to start um, to start getting more goods. And then not only do you see peasant labor, you see on the other end of the spectrum, coerced labor. So people being forced to work. It's not their choice. They're not going there to actually get money off in or really do any of that. So the first one we see is the Spanish use of the Incan Mita. Uh, the Mita system was there before the Europeans arrived. But then the Spanish basically took their the Incan system, twisted it, and made it their own, and forced the Incans to. Uh, I think it was every able-bodied man had to spend two years in the Potosi mine mining silver for the Spanish. So this wasn't a choice. This wasn't something that they were paid for. The Spanish basically said, "Either we'll put you in prison, or mine for us, work for us." This wasn't a choice. And then similarly, you see the Spanish do the encomienda and hacienda system. So they um, they saw Native Americans trade their labor, trade their work on haciendas for religious and language education. And also just, it was really, it was a brutal system because uh, it was almost like uh, Spanish feudalism in a way where the Spanish would give um, richer people land and Native Americans to work for them. So, so really, it wasn't a good system, like all in all. And I think it was one of the first to be outlawed. And I think the 1540s, but you don't really need to know about the specific dates. Then you see indentured servitude. And so indentured servitude is definitely something I see people get confused on a lot. It's essentially, let's say I was living in Britain, right? Or in Spain, let's say. And I go and I commit a crime, you know, now I'm a criminal. Uh oh. So now uh, I can either go to jail. And I can, you know, rot in prison or I can sign an indenture with, uh, and I'll go and work with someone in the Americas for it's typically seven years, five, seven years. And then when I finish, I can get some land, get some money and then start a new life in the Americas. And while this might sound great, it might sound all nice and perfect. Generally, it was so brutal that most indentured servants died before their time, before their indenture was up. And so really, it didn't work out. It worked for some, but not all. And you see in the Americas, really, indentured servants become a huge thing uh, in the 1600s, 1500s because of, um, I'm sure there were some people that did it voluntarily, but it was made mainly for debt and for um, indentured servitude. They wouldn't necessarily had to be a criminal, but they would typically be a criminal or a debtor, people like that, generally. I don't want to say like completely, 
And then finally, you see the big one, you see chattel slavery. And chattel basically means cattle. It means cows, like farm animals. And so you can just see from this name, slaves were not seen as people. They were not seen as, you know, humans. They were seen as pure property. They were not, they didn't have rights. They didn't have the right to get married. They didn't have the right to, you know, learn to read, learn to write. They, their life was dedicated to working for their master who owned them. And really, I mean, I think we've all learned about slavery throughout the years in school. Uh, and even it's kind of fitting that it's uh, um, Black History Month. But, and then we see the Atlantic slave trade. That's the main slave trade during this time period. And it really blows up during this time period. Um, as I said, it really, before it, you know, it started, it picked up some speed. And then once cash crops started, that's the real driving force for slavery. You see things like sugar, tobacco, eventually cotton. Um, they just blew up and a, a slaves started being brought over by extra labor. And yeah, sugar plantations were generally um, the hardest working conditions uh, because it was really, it's hard collecting sugar. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you need to, you know, not only just grab the stocks, but you need to cut them down with machetes and then process it, you know, turn it into rum. It was, it wasn't great. Uh, and then on the very opposite end, so we've been talking about these labor systems that are generally pretty harsh. Now let's talk about the elites during this time period, the people who were rich, the people who really had the power. So you see people like the Manchus and the Creoles, who I'll be talking about later, uh, as the new elites. And then you see existing elites keep their power. So you see European nobles, and you also see um, absolute monarchs arise during this time period, which I'll talk about. Zamindars in the... Um, in the Mughal Empire, and then daimyos in um, in Japan stay. So remember daimyos from the Japanese feudal system. They're kind of like the equivalent of knights in the European system, kind of knights and um, and nobles. Uh, and so you also see from uh, because Europeans are going to the Americas, you now see mixes of races, and you see the first racially based hierarchy rather than based off religion, based off social class wealth now it's really based off of race so you see racial mixing causing this what's called the sociedad de castas uh and so you see mestizos which are europeans uh mixing with native americans to form a mixed race the same thing goes for mulattoes which are europeans plus uh africans who form a mixed race and then you have this whole system be formed and you'll i'll show you a picture just now so here's a picture of what a mixed family might look like. So you see the white man um, is supposedly married to the to the uh, Native American or African woman, and they have mixed children. And so those children are likely mestizos. Um, and so you can see here's the general pyramid. So I'll go through each layer real quick. Peninsulares were people who were born in Spain and were Spanish, just pure Spanish blood the purest you can be, top of the top. Uh, and then after that, you see Creoles, which are um, people who were born to two Spanish parents. However, they were born in the Americas, so they don't quite have as pure a Spanish race. You know, they're still, but they become the elites because the Peninsulares are busy in Spain. So they're the ones who become the elites in Latin America during this time period. Then you see the mixed races, mestizos and mulattoes which we just talked about. And then on the very bottom, you just see Africans and Native Americans. Those were the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. They were really not respected as much as they should be. Not, um, you know, they were commonly slaves. They were commonly, you know, people like that. Um, and so you also see, as I talked about, new elites. <clears throat> uh, and so obviously I said Creoles, they were elites of European descent who got overlooked for top positions uh, for peninsulares. And in the period post, uh, yeah, sure, I can repeat, um, mestizos and mulattoes were mixed races. So basically, if I'm a Spanish person, right, uh, and I go to the Americas and I have a kid with a Native American, my child is a mestizo. If I had a child with an African, now I am, now that's a mulatto. So Creoles, they were the elites, they were born in the Americas, and they were the ones who really uh, run the show over here. After Mestizos was um, just 
mulattoes, and then pure natives and uh, Africans. And then after 1750 in period five, you'll see Creoles start to rise up and actually demand independence. And that's in period five, so you'll get more in depth into that. But eventually that's what you see. <clears throat> <clears throat> then you see in Europe, you see the gentry rise. They were commonly also known as the second estate, especially if you're talking about the French Revolution. Um, the gentry, they were high standing um, nobles. They were the rich people. They were the people who really had um, the power in Europe besides the absolute rulers. They were the rich people. They were the, um, they were the basically, yeah, the top of the top beside uh, kings. Then you also see across the world, just urban entrepreneurs. And this is a new thing that you see due to the new trade systems. Um, globally in port cities, you see um, basically people start getting rich because they start running businesses. You see entrepreneurs like we have now who create a product, run a business, and they, you know, like on Shark Tank, think about that. This is where this all gets to start. So you can see in India, in Turkey, in Africa, everywhere, you see that. And then finally, a new one that you see, just like the Creoles, were the Manchus. So they, so you know how we have the, the Ming Dynasty in 1644. The Manchus come in and they were nomads, I'm pretty sure. But if someone in the chat knows, otherwise correct me. Um, they come in and they defeat the Ming and establish the Qing Dynasty. And they were superior to the Chinese. They considered themselves um, socially more pure. And so it kind of established a new Chinese system of, um, of social uh, formality. And so that's really kind of all this uh, key concept is. It's just the development of new labor systems and new social systems. That's kind of the real big changes. And you want to know the specific social systems in different areas and um, places like that. So now let's just run through these questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. What is kabuki? It was a, um, it was a Japanese style of uh, theater that developed during this time period. Uh, Morgan, what slide are you talking about? Do you mean this one? Sorry. Um, okay, cool. Uh, the rise and fall of gunpowder empires. We'll be talking about that a little later. I should probably not have clicked on this question. So let me just, I'll, I'll get that later. Um, were slaves treated as badly in the Muslim slave trade? I don't believe so. I think it was crueler in the Americas. I'm not too well read on the Muslim slave trade. I kind of only know about the fact that they were more domestic. But generally, when you think of the American and, uh, and Atlantic slave trade, think cruelty. Even on the slave ships, people were head to toe on these giant ships. So yeah. Um, for the essays, how did you best prepare for taking them on the test or even in class? And how did you best utilize the time given for the essays? Uh, I really like this question. This is a great question, whoever asked this. Um, basically, I just made sure that I didn't even write that many practice essays in time for the exam or in time for tests. I would read prompts or read the dbq documents and i would just say am i capable of writing this essay could i genuinely sit down in 40 minutes and write it out so really you want to make sure you want to focus on your weaknesses as well so let's say your essay for your next test is on the columbian exchange let's say it's the 2018 laq that um that was on the last ap exam and it says how were people in the americas affected by the columbian exchange so you want to think if you consistently, when you think about this, can't think of contextualization, you want to make sure that that's something you really focus on. And to best utilize your time, you want to spend probably, you get 40 minutes to write an LEQ and 60 minutes to write a DBQ. For the DBQ, spend your time reading. 15 minutes you should spend probably reading, thinking about the essay, and then just start writing, really. And don't worry about if you're right or not, because you're, you can't lose points on the essays. Uh, speaking of dates, how much do we really need to know dates? Not all that much. I mean, you kind of, what you really want to know is the order of things happen and the general flow of events. So you don't need to know, oh, in, you know, 1453, the Ottomans took over the Byzantine Empire. That's, I mean, that's a very important one, but you are never, never, and I really want to stress this, never going to be asked on an AP exam, what date did this happen? What year did this happen? You might want to know some time spans, but you are never going to necessarily need to know 
um, exact years or dates. <clears throat> um, wow, a lot of questions. Did indentured servitude start before or after slave labor? I'm not sure if there was a particular order either. It's definitely not important. You don't really need to know the order that these things developed. Just know that they all kind of were working together at this uh, during this time period. So yeah, I can't really answer that, so I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, where and by whom was tobacco grown in the Americas? Primarily the South. So if you think like Virginia, um, um, Maryland area, um, North Carolina, South Carolina, that general area, the South, where it's like, it's hot, it's humid. You get these really, really hot areas that are really perfect for growing cash crops. So in the Caribbean, you have sugar. And in the Southern United States, you have tobacco. <clears throat> Were the coerced labor systems mentioned only applied to the Americas? Not to my knowledge. There were probably some slaves in Europe but generally, they were in the Americas for the most part because of this new Atlantic slave trade um, and this new Atlantic trade in general. The Americas really becomes the hub for trading crops, and that's what these labor laborers were used for. All right, so let's move into this final uh, key concept, which is kind of apart from the globalization during this time period. Uh, I think we got a new question. <clears throat> and some of these I kind of have skipped over because they're not specific to this, um, but... I'll answer all the questions by the end, so don't worry. All right, so key concept 4.3. Uh, 4.1 and 4.2, we're all talking about globalization, right? They're all talking about the Americas, connects to Europe, what happens, what are the changes, what are the continuities, stuff like that. So this key concept 4.3 is all about how states consolidated their power. How did people really keep their power during this time period? And so we really see during this time period, and I'll just give you a general overview. This key concept is all about power. So maintaining power, who has the power, and competing for power. So those are the three kind of like, if you're doing an outline, those are the three like bullet points for this, um, for this key concept. So first, the main ways that someone um, maintained power during this time period, you have the arts. So you have architecture, court literature, um, paintings, and I'll show you some really specific pieces of this as illustrative examples that you can know. But generally, arts were really commonly used by almost universally uh, across to kind of paint their rulers as these godly figures. Uh, and speaking of godly figures, we see religion also really be about maintaining power. So we have the divine right in Europe. Basically, if you're going to think of one guy, think of Louis the Fourteenth. He was so enthralled in divine right. He believed that he was given this God-given right to be ruler. It's not, you know, it wasn't about the other people. It was about him being the only person who has a right because God said that he could. And essentially, you see, um, and he was so into this that he literally called himself the Sun King. That's how, like, kind of, you think of it almost like extreme narcissism. But that's what it was, really. <clears throat> and then finally, during this time period, you also see human sacrifice for the 40 so, such on years that the Aztecs uh, survive, you see them really say, you know, we were given by the gods. We need one of you to sacrifice your heart. You know, you have like the beating hearts um, that the Aztecs have. And then they really use that to consolidate their power. When you think about it, people thought, you know, if I don't like these people, they're going to sacrifice me to the gods. And then you also see bureaucracy, governments using the government to, um, to really consolidate their power. So one, which is a big continuity in China, is the Confucian-based scholar gentry. So you see the civil service exams, those aren't stopping. If anything, they're getting bigger. Um, more people are taking them, more people are passing them. And the exam is really used because of this Confucian ideal that education is the top of the world. That education is what separates the people who deserve to be the top of the social system from people who aren't, that and patriarchy. And then you see the Devshirme system in the Ottoman Empire, which is essentially where the Ottomans would take Christian boys, take them to their empire, convert them to Islam, um, and force them to learn Islam and to fight in their army uh, and to be their nobles. And so that was a way that they really helped um, their empire to consolidate their power. Speaking of power, it's really important in this time period to know who has the power. 
So we have two types of empires that developed during this time period. <laughs> we have the land empires and we have the maritime empires. And so with land empires, we see the Manchus in China. They're the Qing dynasty. Uh, we see the Mughals in India. They're one of the gunpowder empires along with the Ottomans. And then we see the Russians. You also see the Safavids who are in Iran, but they're not quite as, por uh, as important in the course, but they're definitely worth knowing. And then the maritime empires, you just think of your European countries. You have the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, and the British. So the Portuguese and the Spanish really start taking over land in the Americas, whereas the Dutch, French, and British start to take over islands in the Caribbean and in India. So they develop their joint stock companies, the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. And finally, you see competition. Obviously, everyone wants the power. Um, yeah, Alizar, if you ask a question about it, I'll go over the fur trade and Russia and Siberia. Um, so you see competition for trade, as I was talking about, the Ottomans versus the Europeans, you know, the constant battle, who's going to be able to have the most money by the end of this time period. And obviously, this is what pushes the Europeans to the to the West that pushes them to the um, to the Americas. You see state rivalries. Uh, so you see like the Thirty Years War and the Ottoman versus the Safavids. So you see um, the Ottomans were Sunni and the uh, Safavids were Shia. And so you see them have this clash in the Battle of Chaldaran. <clears throat> what were the names of the joint stock companies? They were main, uh, the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. And then you finally see local resistance. So you see things like peasant uprisings. Wasn't also religious war. Yeah, it was, um, it was religious war. Yeah, there were some, I'm sure, the, I think the Crusades were going on during this time period a little bit, um, but it's not as big. And then you see uh, local resistance happening. So you see samurai results, you see peasant uprisings, you see things like that really rise during this time period. So let's start getting into these really bigger. So here were the religious ideas to legitima legitimize rule. So you have divine right, which we were talking about, where European monarchs, they answer to God. So not parliament not nobles, they themselves. It's almost like a dictatorship. Um, you also see Shiism. So the Safavids were the largest Shia state in history, and they forced um, conversion. So basically, they forced people to be, um, uh, what's the word? They forced people to be in their empire and be, um, wow, I'm really losing my words here. And they had a divinely appointed political religious leader. So you see a, um, a theocracy build in this empire, similar to how you had the caliphs before. Here's where you have more the uh, theocratic leaders. <clears throat> you see Aztec sacrifice. So they're vassal states because remember the Aztecs were tributary. People had to pay people um, so that they could pay tribute to the Aztecs in terms of giving sacrifice to the gods, to their, you know, to the sun gods and all that people. You see in the Songhai or Songhai empire, you see Islam being used to, um, to promote trans-Saharan trade and learning. So you see things like Timbuktu, and they were um, taught obedience to the king. So that's really Islam being used to tell people, your king is holy, your king should be respected. And then you see Confucian ritual. So you obviously see the scholar gentry stays around, and those type of people stay around, and they really are the ones who still run the show in the bureaucracy in China. You also see art and architecture, which we'll really be going into. You see the Ottoman miniatures. So it had royal workshops that made depictions of sultans and their daily lives. And so this really helped to kind of portray them as both normal people and as royal figures. It shows their glamorous lifestyle. You know, whoa, don't you wish you could be here? Um, and similarly, you see the Qing imperial portraits. Um, so you have uh, the image of the emperor really being used carefully. You want to portray the emperor as a perfect being, as someone who is as close to all powerful as possible without getting on the people's nerves to the point where they um, revolt. You see Mughal mausoleums. Uh, so things like you see, um, you know, mosques and mausoleums and they pro uh, projected to the world, this monumental architecture being used to show the rest of the world, Hey, we're better than you. <laughs> we have this money, this wealth, this power, and it blended a lot of Islamic and Indian styles. And then finally, you see European palaces really rise. So I'll be showing you a more detailed picture of the Palace of Versailles in a bit. That's really a big um, piece of architecture 
that shows, oh, Louis the 14th is just so good. <clears throat> so here's a map of the, um, of the land empires during this time period. So we see the Ottoman Empire right here. And I'll turn on this little. So we see the Ottoman Empire right here at their peak. Then we have the Safavid Empire and the, um, and the Mughal Empire kind of all right next to each other. And then China is right here. So we can see Qing China is pretty big. And then um, Jap Japan, Japan's over here. And then we see Russia all the way up here. So those are kind of the big land empires. And you can see this in relation with the rest of the world up here. So that's kind of, that's, that's period four, really. Everything that I um, just went through was all the key concepts for period four. So now let's just give ourselves kind of a final overview of what we covered. So this is a map of the world in 1450. This is, um, I'll be going over the Taj Mahal in detail. So, <clears throat> so basically, this is 1450. This is before this time period starts. You can see there aren't many empires in the, um, in the Americas. We just have the Aztecs and the Incas. We still have Polynesian migrations. We see Timbuktu um, and Mombasa, these uh, African trade empires. And then we see Europe's kind of still a little dead. The Byzantine Empire is still around. Novgorod and the cave in Rus, stuff like that. And then by 1750, we had this new global system, this new global world that connects everyone together. We also see though the beginnings of imperialism. So we can see there's no longer an Aztec empire. We see the French, the British, uh, the Spanish, all down here. That's, that's how big their empire was. Then we had the, Peru, um, the Portuguese over here, a little bit of British territory, not much. And then just little scatterings of um, different types of European powers. And then along here, we have our land empires that we just talked about, and then more islands taking over. So really, those are the major powers during this time period. We see, as you can see on the bottom, those were the major big powers that you're going to want to know for the test. So I think maps are really, um, I just, so they could be bigger. I didn't put them side by side, just so I could really, you know, I can do a quick, you know, this is kind of the comparison that you can draw, that you can see what's going on. Uh, and here's just a giant box of everything that happened during this time period. So this was split up across um, different areas of the world. And you can see like just these giant bars of Portuguese empire, Spanish empire, French empire, British empire, Spanish, Dutch, Portuguese, you know, these were the major powers. You don't have, like you saw before, a bunch of different kind of scattered around little empires. You see these major giant maritime empires grow to their fullest extent. Yeah, Jeremy, you're right. Better defined states uh, are being grown rather than little tiny, you know, collections of societies. You see empires now, real, true, imperialistic European empires. Uh, all right. So now we're going to be talking about a little bit of art and architecture. So essentially we see, so we're going to be going through just a bunch of different notable pieces of art and architecture that are relevant to the key concepts. All right. So this first one, um, can you guys name this, what this is called? You know, you, I'm just kind of curious. School of Athens. Yeah. That's what this is. All right. Oh, I just realized I forgot to go through these questions. All right. We'll put this on hold for a sec. Let me go through these questions. I'm dumb. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm trying to find like where I left myself off. There we go. Are the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas period three or four? Mostly period three, but they're relevant in period four to give us some context. <clears throat> uh, what were the four uh, gunpowder empires? Uh, it was the Ottomans, the Safavids, uh, and the Mughals were the three big ones. I don't know if there's a fourth. There's not one that I know of. All right, that seems to be the only ones that are relevant that I can answer right now. And then I'll answer the rest right at the end. Yeah, this is definitely going to go over an hour. All right, so here we have the School of Athens. Um, and this painting really shows the, um, shows the fact that the Renaissance wasn't just an art movement. It took from classical ideals from, um, from the period before. So we don't see any more um, you know, medieval art. We see stuff like classical Greek ideas coming back. So this is clearly a painting of blatant, you know, it's Greece. I mean, you see people like, uh, you know, we have down here, 
uh, I think up here is Pythagoras. We've got, I believe this is, um, they're two famous Greek philosophers. I'm blanking on their names right now. If someone knows them, let me know. Uh, and so you can really see how classical ideals are being pulled. Right. Um, the same goes for this painting. This is the, the birth of Venus. This is another Renaissance painting that essentially um, it shows classical ideas. So you see, um, oh, Plato and Aristotle. That's what it is. I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you see the um, new classical ideas really come into fruition that these, these Greek myths really start being portrayed through the art of the Renaissance. <clears throat> and so here we can see uh, a comparison between on the left, we have a piece of medieval art. On the right, we have a self-portrait by, um, by Durer is his name, I think. And so we can really see that, first of all, you know, things start to get more um, sophisticated in terms of the style. You know, we see in on the left, we have more simpler shapes, more, sh you know, not much shading, stuff like that. And on the right, it almost looks photorealistic. Um, you also see humanism develops. So you can see before over here, it's an entire group of, of people. And over here, this is one guy. And even you can see, if you look closely enough, he looks like Jesus. He painted himself to look like Jesus. So we see this, um, this emphasis of the individual grow during the Renaissance. <clears throat> All right, here is some African art. Um, you can see here from this cross, Christianity permeated into Africa during this time period mainly. Uh, you see Christianity start being developed uh, and push out Islam to an extent. There's still Islam in Africa, but um, there is, it's there. Christianity really starts to make um, an entrance. And you can really, you know, when you're looking at African art, there's really a couple of things that are really noticeable. You see, like, um, I tend to notice a lot, like, long necks, long faces, um, stuff like that. It's really pretty noticeable when you have a piece of African art. Um, but, yeah, really the main thing I want to put here is Christianity in Africa. All right, so this is um, a painting of um, to, uh, Ieyasu Tokugawa, or it might be swapped. He was um, a Japanese shogun, and his empire was really important because it um, because it closed off its borders. He was really the definition of isolationist. He would only allow the Dutch to show up at one port at specific times, just then and there. That's it. And so really something that's important about him is the fact, first of all, it represents a continuity of feudalism in Japanese history, but it's also their, their economy. Uh, you're going to see, um, you're going to see them develop into this new economy in the, in period five, the title of 27. Uh, this is the birth of Venus. That's what it's called. The birth of Venus. All right. So here we see, um, uh, some noticeable pieces. So these, um, on the left, you see, uh, St. Patrick's or St. Basil's, it's St. Basil's Cathedral. Uh, and so this is a piece of monumental architecture, just like we saw. And it was commissioned by Ivan the Terrible, who was the first uh, Tsar of Russia. And then on the very right, we see Peter the Great, who is really one of the most important Russian figures during this time period. He is the guy who really pushes for the westernization of Russia. So we see Russia starts looking towards Europe, who's getting rich. They're, you know, they're having a good time. And they're looking, they're freezing in the snow. And, they're, and he's thinking, you know, what are we going to do? And he steps up and he says, you know, we're going to westernize. We're going to become like them. And so what he does is, and it's a pretty cool story, actually. He disguises himself, goes to Europe, um, and learns shipbuilding on his own. Just out of nowhere, this guy just learns shipbuilding. Um, and so he comes back and completely rebuilds the Russian Navy to become, and they really establish a a large naval po uh, power and they start trading they start by uh, getting wealth and you can even see like if you saw this guy in a painting you would not think he was a russian you would by all means think he was a um a european and that's because of it he developed haircuts and he really wanted everything to be european so that's really the importance of peter the great and if you want to want me to go more in depth you can ask a question and i can really i'll be happy to talk about the expansion of russia it's pretty interesting all right, here, I know someone was asking me to go over this. This is the Taj Mahal. And so essentially what this was, and there's a note down here. Yeah, it's a, this is a, an example of a mausoleum. 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> Peter forgot to try to fix the serfs. He was also an alcoholic. It's it's a nuanced issue. So basically, um, this is a mausoleum built by Shah. What was his name? Shah uh, Jahan. And this is a, a tomb essentially for his wife. And so it's a it's a monument. And you see this. You know, when someone in your family dies, you might mourn. You might get them a nice ga- um, graves gravestone stuff like this. This guy built an entire giant monument for his wife. Not only that, but it also just proved to the world. India is a force to be, yeah, it was the ultimate flex. India is a force to be dealt with at this point. You know, uh, (laughs) India isn't just, you know, this, in period three, they were the Delhi Sultanate. They were kind of going crazy. They were disorganized. And now they're this giant gunpowder empire uh, who, and they're just showing off to the world. They're saying, you know, look at us. We've gotten much better. And then um, this isn't the final one. This is the Palace of Versailles. So another example of um, of monumental architecture to promote uh, power. Basically, uh, like, give me one second. There we go. So you see P, um, Louis the Fourteenth uh, sets this up to be an example of he's he kind of he's he's flexing on everyone in France essentially. I know it sounds kind of stupid, but that's what he's doing. He's saying, you know. How, look at all these puny mortals. I'm over here in my giant palace, living the life, and they're up here working. You know, he it was really an example of just how powerful he was. And it's a pretty beautiful palace, too. I've never been, but it's it's beautiful. All right. Um, this is the uh, signature of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman, um, the Ottoman Sultan, who really helped to expand the empire, who really helped to take the empire from just this little ragtag group of nomads all the way to this pretty large empire. Um, and so this was his signature. And you can see it's really, there's a lot of symbolic meaning in, the, in, in this. I don't know the exact things, but this was taken, taken from the Met website and this is hanging uh, in the Met. So if you're ever in New York and you see this in the Met, no, now you know what it is. And you can, you know, prove to people your knowledge. And then this one, uh, yeah, this is the last one. So this is a painting of the Sociedad de Costas you can see all the different types of mixed races. So you see a hierarchy being built from, um, you know, from Spanish uh, born Spaniards all the way down to, um, you know, uh, to African people having an African child. So there's a real hierarchy that builds based off of race, not based off wealth, not based off of, you know, how educated you are. It's based off the color of your skin completely, your genetics. So yeah, that is period four, essentially, in a nutshell. There's a lot more nuance to some things, and I'd be happy if you ask a question to go into specifics about a specific area, a specific thing. Uh, and I know there are a bunch of questions that now I'll run through these in completion. But it's really, uh, I'd be happy to go through some things. So just, this is kind of now question and answer time. Right. Uh, I know this is the period four review, but there are upcoming period five, are there upcoming period five reviews? There will be eventually, and I'm hoping I can do a full period five review, especially if you guys like this, you know, let me know and I'll be sure to do a period five review. Uh, So yeah, that's definitely something I'm interested in doing. Uh, Important needs to know concepts, the key concepts, essentially, if you're gonna know one thing. Basically, um, you're gonna wanna know globalization, the new social and labor structures, and how power was consolidated. That's the big three, essentially. Uh, how useful is Guns, Germs, and Steel? We watched one episode. Um, it's definitely, it's a good series. You don't need to watch it, but it's definitely really fun to watch. I, I recommend it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, sometimes bringing in specific facts are really good for helping your argument, especially in the LEQ. What's the best way to make sure you remember specifics? I'd say just Quizlets and studying and making sure you understand things conceptually, because if you understand things conceptually and the connections, it's easier to know things um, just rotely. Uh, The three key points were like in just a couple of words, globalization, social and labor systems, and and the consolidation of power and new powers. Uh, Is it necessary to know about humanism? Not really. I mean, it should be like a term that you know, but you won't need to know about it in super depth. Just know that it focuses on the individual as opposed to the group. Uh, Could you mention the rise and fall of land empires? Yep, sure. Okay. So let me pull up this map over here. Where are you? 
Um, there it is. Okay, so we have uh, a couple of main empires that rise during this time period. We have the Ottoman Empire over here, the Safavids, the Mughals, uh, the Russians, and the Chinese. The Russians, they really don't fall until 1917 when the, uh, when the USSR takes over and it becomes a communist state. So that's during World War I. That's period six. You'll learn about that. Same goes for, uh, for the Ottoman Empire. They'll actually stick around. But the thing is, by period five, they're known as the sick man in Europe. They're really kind of falling apart at the seams. They're not doing great. They're not having a good time. And they really, um, they fall because of... Um, because of just weakness. And after World War I, they lose and their whole empire just is capitulated. Finally, um, the Chinese empire, they fall the Qing. They're the last Chinese dynasty. They fall to nationalistic revolts during the night uh, in 1911, the Guomindang takes over. And then eventually in 1949, Mao Zedong takes over his empire. And that whole thing happens with uh, communist China. So yeah, those are like the big things. It's all like these stick around for a couple of time periods. I know um, the Qing dynasty is 1644 to 1911. So this sticks around for at least period five. <clears throat> uh, do you ever do live streams helping people write an LEQ or a DBQ? I've done, uh, I know there was a DBQ slide last week or a couple of weeks ago. The LEQ uh, presentation will be on the 25th, I'm pretty sure. So that'll be in a couple of weeks. But um, also, if you want me to just like, if you want you know me to help you out privately, feel free to hit me up on social media, on Discord, on Instagram, something like that. Uh, if you guys don't have that, you know, ask me if you want it. So yeah, you know, shameless plug. <clears throat> um, what was the isolationist shogun's name again? Um, Tokugawa is like the one you want to know. <clears throat> Why is Ivan the terrible? Terrible. He um. He was just a ruthless ruler. He would have people executed. He was just a, a bad guy, generally. He was just a ruthless. He would kill you for any amount of insurrection, to be honest. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm going to keep running through these questions, but I know it's probably late for the majority of you, so you guys can feel free to go and you know have lives. <clears throat> is there a continuity with Indian Ocean trade routes? If so, uh, what specifically is being traded and where to? Yeah, the things being traded generally stays the same. Spices, uh, you know, stuff like that. The only change that you see really is the European involvement now. So you see Europeans go, you know, they come all the way from up here in Europe. They go around Africa and then they show up around here in um, and down here and around Calicut um, and the major trading cities. And they're the ones who really, really take over eventually. This is the reason that the this empire falls because the British eventually show up and say, you know what? This is ours now. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Yep. See ya, uh, Alyssa. All right. Can you explain the expansion of the Russian Empire? Yeah, sure. Totally. I'm going to probably just have to keep this map up. So, essentially, in 1450, you have this little group of, of, um, of Russians called the Kievan Rus just sitting here. And then eventually, they just start kind of um, migrating west. And then Peter the Great comes in and they establish Sardom's, you know, St. Petersburg. That's named after Peter the Great. Uh, and they, they start really pushing for westward expansion because they want to become just powerful. They want to get giant. And they're still, to this day, the largest country in the world. And so really, uh, it was because of their westernization efforts that really helped them rise to power. What else do we have? Uh, all right, we got a couple more. All right. um, may you please provide uh, an explanation of con uh, contextualization and continuity? Okay, continuity is the easiest one. It's basically, if I ask you for a continuity, I'm asking you what stayed the same. Uh, whereas um, with a change, it's what changed. You know, I know that's kind of using the word and definition, but that's essentially what's going on. Contextualization is a little more nuanced. Essentially, imagine if you're watching a, um, if you're watching like a, an episode of Scandal, let's say, and a new season comes on, they're going to show you like a last season on Scandal type of thing, right? But they aren't going to tell you every little thing that happened that season. They're not going to tell you in episode four, blank and blank did said this, 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 and this. They're going to tell you the big things that you have to know. So it's the big giant world things. It's not like, you know, the Chinese emperor dying. It's the globalization efforts in period four. It's these giant world bound things. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you can do this, but if you could split up the period four reviews into the key concepts and do each of them as separate videos, it would help. Yeah, I'm sorry that this was probably a real overload of information for just an hour. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, if you guys really want, I can record period four videos going in depth into each key concept, if you guys like. Uh, if you want that, you know, just drop in the chat, yes, no. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, where is it? Yeah, I can totally do that. All right. See you, Katie. All right. Um, was westernization of Russia basically limited to nobles and the elite class? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. You still had the serfs and the peasants, and they really weren't getting the grunt of, I mean, they were getting the grunt of still working, and they weren't getting this fancy new technology and these new Western ideals. They were, they were still Russians. They were still, you know, sitting in Siberia, just kind of being themselves. So they definitely, it's definitely more of a noble thing that they get. Uh, that seems to knock out, oh, never mind, we have one more. Uh, can we talk about the importance of monopolies going around? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not too knowledgeable on specific monopolies and stuff like that, but we definitely see kind of trade being narrowed down from a bunch of different states to, as I was talking about, a few different companies. We see really the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and these maritime empires that I was mentioning. They really rise, and they're the only big ones trading. They become a global economy, essentially. All right, that tops off the question. So I'm going to kind of sit here for a few minutes, see if we have any more questions. If not, uh, oh, wow, that was quick. All right. Um, are there some additional information that we should know for the Ottoman Empire? Um, know that they were, they were sunny. That's definitely helpful to know. Uh, know that they eventually become Turkey in period six. Um, and then in period five, you're going to learn a lot more about their efforts for, um, <clears throat> for their uh, industrialization. And that's really period five. So I'm not going to go into detail for this now. But I will, um, I'll go over that when I do my period five review. And you'll be learning about that. You see things like the Young Turks rise. Um, and it's a big thing that really contributes to their, both their rise and their fall. <clears throat> um, can you repeat the major empires and their achievements? Yeah, sure. So let me pull up this world map here. So we have, I'm going to go slowly through this. So we have Russia. Their big thing is expansion. They become, you know, if you're going to look at one empire on this map, it's Russia. They're the largest being on this map right now. They take up like, you know, they take up almost all of Africa or all Asia. Um, so that was really their big thing. Also, Westernization. They develop a super powerful navy, um, and that was all thanks to Peter the Great, really, in my opinion. And then right next to them, we see China, Qing China. Their major things were. Um, here, let me drop that as a question because that's a good question. I like that. So uh, another big thing was. Um, with China, with Qing China was um, really the fact that they kind of cut themselves off from this global trade. Um, basically, they, they after Zheng He, they kind of stopped. They, they kept doing land trade and they had silver trade going on, but they, they weren't as involved as they really could have been. So they kind of got the, the short end of the stick there. Uh, Japan, they stayed pretty centralized and pretty powerful. Their big things uh, is just re uh, regressing into, you know, they kind of got rid of guns. They got rid of Christianity. They become very conservative, very like a very centralized, very um, isolationist state. They trade was literally forbidden until 1800, not eight, the year, but during the 1800s. Uh, we also see then the maritime empires, which we see the British and the French and the Dutch. Their big ones were imperialistic uh, colonies. So you can see down here, you know, you can see these little ports of um, of the British down here. That's the British East India Company. And then down here, we see the Dutch East India Company in Indonesia. And so we see they disrupt this trade pattern because before it was just here. You now the British are here, the Indians are here, the Dutch are here. So they really disrupt this whole area. Uh, China, yeah, they almost kind of cut themselves off. They didn't completely because they wanted to stay into the silver trade, but they sort of um, stay a little bit isolationist. Then we see the Spanish and the Portuguese empires. The big thing with the Portuguese empire that you see also, they take a lot of uh, forts and stuff along the Western coast of Africa, not enough to really be shown on this map. They can kind of be over here. Um, and they facilitated the slave trade a lot. They also, if you think about it, you know, you hear a lot that if you look at the languages of South America, and I always found this really interesting, um, you know, you see Spanish all down here, and then you see Portuguese in Brazil. And I was thinking, you know, why is that? This is why, because you see they, 
you know, they uh, were Portuguese. They were Portuguese um, subjects for, you know, as, until they became independent. Um, and then the Spanish, their big things were the reason that they went is they were looking for God, gold, and glory. Those were the three motivations for going there. So we see God, they want to spread Christianity. That was their big thing. Uh, gold, they wanted riches and glory. They wanted to be the, the best that they could, the best empire in the world. And this goes back to their power struggle. <clears throat> and then we see things like pirates, also competition over trade routes, um, you know, and imperialism, stuff like that. So that really is kind of just a big thing across the world. <clears throat> All right, what is a monopoly? Um, a monopoly is basically where if you had a free market, right? So like how we live in a free market society, if a business does so think like the college board, they're the only people who offer um, college um, college courses in high school. You can't really think of another one that's at least popular besides maybe IB, but it's not really the same. And so they're allowed to kind of abuse their consumers as much as they want, because what are they gonna do? Go to another business? There isn't another business. So that's kind of what a monopoly is. Uh, I was just wondering, when did you start studying and how did you take notes? I started studying probably around March-ish. Uh, we did a mock AP. I remember it was April 20th of last year was our mock AP in school. And then um, we, um, and then I kind of just, I would go over things and I would write essays and I would write DBQs. And then in the end of April, I took another mock AP to see where I was weak. And for that last week, I kind of just grinded out. But my one suggestion, and I feel like a lot of people uh, don't do this, the last night, do not cram. What you don't know that day, you won't know tomorrow morning. And so really, you want to know everything before the day before. You should, when you get home, and I'll tell you, actually, I'll just tell you what I did. I got home from school on May 16th, the day before the AP exam, and I took a nap. Literally, I got home and just asleep. And then I got up. I played video games. I had a good night. Got I was in bed at nine. And then I woke up and I walked to the bus stop and I took the exam well rested with a good breakfast. I know I'm kind of saying the things that everyone says, but it's because it works. Yeah. Sleep. <clears throat> uh, how old are you? I am a sophomore, so I am 15. <clears throat> How's AP Chem? It's good. You know, going well, good, getting good grades. <laughs> uh, yeah, that seems to be all the questions for now. Um, does anyone else have any other questions about this? Um, I'll drop here. I'll drop my social media just in case you have a question, um, you know, about all this stuff. Yeah, I took AP World as a freshman. So yeah, it doesn't look like anyone has any more questions. And so um, I think I'm going to end this. So just kind of last comments, concerns, you know, Drop them now or forever hold your peace. Oh, yeah, I'll drop my social media. I don't know why Discord isn't opening right now, but um, yeah, I'll, drop, I'll give you my Instagram. Thank you. Uh, there you go. So that's my, um, my Instagram account. So if you have any questions, you know, DM me. I'll be, I'll try to get back to you. And also I am happy to like, if you want to work together one-on-one -on, -one on an essay or on content, I'm more than happy to uh, go with you and talk about that. Yeah. I, I'm really lucky that I got to take AP world as a freshman. I mean, you guys are lucky because you're the last AP world class ever. So really, you know, all right. Uh, we have another question. Ooh, I, I love this question. I really love this question. What happens if you completely blank on the exam? This is this is a real fear of mine that it's it's an element of surprise that really kind of freaks you out that you don't know what the essays are going to be. And so one thing that really helps you to calm down is being confident in yourself. But let's just say you open up the exam booklet and you say, crap, I don't know what this means. Just try write down everything you know about this thing. Uh, it's right above. I'll drop it again. Just everything, because really, even if you write down the, you know, just complete nonsense you're going to, um, you know, you're not, you're not able to lose points. You're just going to be able to, you're only able to gain points. By the way, that slash isn't part of the username. I just can't send the same message twice. Um, really, you, you want to just write, when in doubt, write it down. Because let's say you get, let's say you write something down that's correct. And now you got the evidence point. You know, you wrote down a claim that you're not really clear on. 
but it was right. You got the thesis point. You know, if you don't even write it down, you're not giving yourself the chance to earn those points. And you can't lose those points once you get them. <clears throat> yeah, the only reason that I, I did well in the AP exam was my teacher. She's a god. All right. Um, just wondering what type of questions does the multiple choice consist of? Is it analyzing stuff or knowing facts? Here, I will actually pull up. Uh, there it is. This is a practice test from the exam. I will switch my screen real quick if I can. Close video, share screen, Chrome tab, there it is. All right, so I'll show you some multiple choice questions. We went over these in the past, um, a past stream. These are what they look like. So it's essentially, they will give you a, um, a document, a painting, a, a something, you know, some sort of excerpt, and then you will have to answer questions after reading them. So for example, we have, you know, this little poem from the Mauryan dynasty, a couple of questions we have, a little excerpt, a couple of questions, a graph, and a couple of questions. And so really, you want to learn how to answer these types of questions really effectively. Um, you're the last AP World curriculum because they're changing the curriculum. They're going to establish an AP World Modern and an AP World Ancient. It's just, it, they're reorganizing the course. You're the last true AP World course. All right. Uh, we're at an hour and a half. I know we're only allowed to go up to two hours. So if anyone else has any more questions, is every multiple choice question based on some sort of document? Um, yes, every single multiple choice question is based on a document of some way, shape, or form. Here, I just have to start answering this. So yeah, they are. You will always have some sort of document, graph, picture. If I can find uh, a painting in here, here's a you know data. Um, it's mostly going to be yeah. Here's a map, for example, so we can see you know typical sailing routes and schedules of merchants in 1400. So this is a period three questions. We have the monsoon winds. We got, you know, and you, uh, you know, you get quicker at this as you go along. But then you, you know, and then I ask you a question: Which particular routes and timings of the voyages best reflect which of the following characteristics? And so you have, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, what do you guys think the answer might be for this question? It's kind of quick, but you know, you guys can drop. I uh, hear I'm going to drop the link for this practice test because this is a good one. This is an official one from the College Board. Yeah the college board or review books. Though I, I didn't do great on the Princeton review test, so. All right, so this is the type of question that you, it's typical, you know, maps, graphs. I, I still can't believe there, a painting, you know. So that's really the type of thing that you're gonna be seeing on the multiple choice questions. You think the answer was A for this one? Omar, you think the answer is A? Yeah, okay, um, I, I would say B. I'm not sure what the answer is, I could be wrong. And if you get it wrong, I'll explain the uh, I'll explain the question. So 19 was B. Okay, so I'll explain it. So we have, this is a period three question. So if we go all the way back up, 19 was B. So the answer was that there, uh, it showed their advanced knowledge of Indian Ocean currents. So let's take a look back at this picture up here. So we have, these trade routes, um, and you can see the patterns of their trade routes that you can see they have their outbound in November through May, and they return October through May, and they have this calendar based system. And so they use the monsoons, and that's how they got around. So that's why that question is B and not A. But I can see why you might think it's A. Yeah, that's yeah, read all the answer choices. All right, any recommendations for resources? Um, Mr. Lassiter is great. He has a good YouTube channel. Crash Course World History, get a five. In fact, I'm going to drop something that I should have dropped hours ago. It's um, I developed basically just like an ultimate review, pa uh, not packet, but an ultimate like uh, system with like uh, of just a bunch of resources and stuff. It's just a folder full of outlines, resources, a list of stuff. And so that's really my recommendation to use that to your advantage. It has guides. It has lists of sites. It's really good, in my opinion. Uh, how specific do you have to study the content? You should know like people and stuff. It's helpful to know, but at the same time, don't go crazy. Like, don't think I need to know every year and every person. No, no, you need to know trends and connections and comparisons and skills. That's the big point of this exam. They're not testing you on how well you can memorize dates. They're testing you on how well you can analyze world history. And so really you need to know specific things for evidence points, but not to the point where you're cramming your head. All right. 
Um, so yeah, that is kind of everything. So any more questions, you know, I'll give you another minute or so to drop any questions and then I'll end the broadcast. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of sit here. Just wait. Oh, there we go. All right. Do they often repeat questions from different years? I don't know. I haven't seen any other tests, so I can't tell you yes or no. I don't think so, but they might. That might be why you can't talk about the multiple choice. So, you know, I can't answer that question because I'm not the college board. <laughs> All right, so yeah, um, I think any more questions? And we're kind of really slowing down here. <clears throat> Sorry, like my throat's dead. <laughs> Nope, no more questions. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna end this right now, unless anyone has a question right now. So uh, I will see, you. oh, okay. Are you taking a push? My school offers a two year long AP US history. So um, I'm in pre a push right now. Next year I'll be taking a push, a push. So we're doing a push periods one through four now, or no, one through five, and then six through nine in 11th grade. A push is AP US history. All right. <clears throat> oh my God. Oh my God. I feel really bad for teachers after this. My throat. All right. Um, what was the thing about the extra points on the LEQ and DBQ? Okay. They used to have what was called the expanded core. It really wasn't, you know, uh, it's not a thing anymore, but it's um, it was just kind of for people who went above and beyond. Yeah, it is a weird system. Our school is doing a lot of reform around our schooling. So yeah, A-Push has so much more. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's really nice actually because the workload's a lot less. Uh, have you used the Worldopedia? And if you have, would you say it generally helped? I used it a little bit. I didn't use it as like a dead set. This is the correct stuff. I mean, it was correct, but I didn't use this as like my main study guide, especially because it's still a work in progress. But it definitely offered some really good information and it was good for just reference like wikipedia i mean you didn't use it for dead studying but if i wanted to know you know a specific key concept or something i would go to ap worldopedia all right back at square one just give you guys another minute or two drop any questions you have and then if it gets to like uh you know an hour 45 which i don't foresee this happening or an hour 50 i can start a new session if it goes over two hours because that's our limit <clears throat> so any other questions comments concerns <sighs> so i'm to pewdiepie yeah okay so i'm going to take these last few minutes to just say subscribe to pewdiepie you know period for review so yeah that's kind of the main thing that if you're going to take anything out of this subscribe to pewdiepie <clears throat> um that'll be good thanks we probably won't need that. That will be on the exam. That's actually, I'm in the college board. That is your DBQ. The extent to which PewDiePie is a god. Yes. All right. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to kind of end it here. If you guys have any other questions, you uh, you have my social media. I'll drop them right, uh, right down here one more time. Um, you know, also just shameless promotions because why not? Oh, we got another question. All righty, perfect. Uh, random question. Why would you spend your Monday night doing this? One, I have no life. Uh, second, I, I enjoy doing this. I really do. I, I've thought about being a teacher a lot recently, and I definitely really enjoy talking to people about AP World and teaching people. It's definitely like a passion of mine that I like, you know, teaching people and talking about the, uh, especially history with people. Uh, any major African empires or states we should know? Um, I would say things like the... Um, like the Songhai Empire and just the empires from really period period three that kind of stuck around. So you can see you have Songhai over here. But then in period five, these empires just fall apart, just completely. Uh, I got a five on the AP World exam. Thank God. Um, yeah, I got a five, which I'm really happy about. All right. Uh, so we're back here. <laughs> I'll give you guys another, I'll wait until like a minute 35. If you guys have any more questions, type them in. You know, I will, I'll stay here for as long as you guys want. Just, yeah. Any other questions? Nope, not that I'm seeing. All right, I think I'm going to end this then. Um, 
it was great. You know, I hope you guys learned a lot about period four. Hope I helped you guys out. If you guys have any questions, you know, um, send me, uh, hit me up, send me a message. I'll be happy to talk to you about whatever your issue is. Um, and so yeah, have a good night. Right, see you.